Welcome to our session on a roundtable on revolutionary violence. I'm Gary Cates uh, from Pomona College, and uh, I'm going to introduce all of the four speakers at once so we can, once they take it over, have the discussion flow uh, more evenly, and then we'll throw it to the audience after the individual presentations. I just want to begin by making one brief introductory comment, and that's <coughs> that when I was asked to chair this session, it reminded me of a dim memory in my head from a roundtable symposium. I don't remember the exact topic, but it was at a conference like this during the bicentennial of the French Revolution in 1989. And what strikes me, what, what struck me about that symposium was how no matter what we said and no matter um, the prepared documents we came with, the ground from under us was moving <laughs> because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the beginnings of the collapse. I mean, it wouldn't collapse for two and a half more years, but the, the demise of the Soviet Empire, the fall of communism. Of course, the Marxist paradigm had been crumbling for a long time then, but it was really the way that the Soviet Union fell that somehow we all knew would change the way we thought about the French Revolution, but it was very, very hard to express in 1989, and it seemed to overshadow even the bicentennial. This meeting, it seems to me, is a similar moment in terms of revolutionary violence in which somehow the Arab Spring is changing the way we might think about revolutionary violence, but since we're only in the middle chapters of whatever the Arab Spring is and is becoming, it's hard to know how it's reshaping our thoughts about revolutionary violence long ago. So with that, and I, I hope there are echoes of that throughout both the presentations that follow and, and, and the discussion when we throw it open to you. So the, uh, uh, there's, there's obviously no way and no need to introduce our first speaker, Lynn Hunt, because she was introduced so well by the Associate Dean last evening and we were all there and heard that, so I'm gonna turn this into a quiz. <laughs> uh, for the audience, the pinnacle of being a historian like us is to be translated into French. That's like, you know, I don't think there, uh, have there been as many that have won the Nobel Prize in economics, you know, that's, <laughs> it's a very, it's very rare. And you heard that l last night, you heard in the full introduction that Lynn has been translated, I think, into 11 languages, including French, but there have only been two of Lynn's books that have been translated into French. Which are they? Human rights. Family. Human and rights. And politics, culture. No, family, no. Romance. family romance. Very good. I don't know who, <laughs> I don't know who gets the prize. <laughs> very good. Very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, following, following Lynn Hunt will be Laura Mason. Laura taught for many years at the University of Georgia and since 2011 has been senior lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. She is the author of Singing the French Revolution, published by Cornell, and with Tracy Rizzo, the documentary source book, French Revolution, published by Houghton Mifflin. For the last few years, she has turned her attention to the Thermidorian period and is currently working on a book about Babeuf and the Conspiracy of Equals. Uh, following uh, Laura will be Jeremy Popkin. Jeremy has been teaching history at the University of Kentucky, perhaps since the terror itself, no, I, <laughs> for, for, for a very long time. For many years, his research interests lay in the area of the press and political culture in, in the French Revolution. 
He is perhaps most widely known for his popular textbooks with Prentice Hall, A History of Modern France, now in its fourth edition, A Short History of the French Revolution, now in its third edition. In the past several years, he has turned his attention to the Haitian Revolution, and of his many publications to date, perhaps the most influential is You Are All Free, The Haitian Revolution and the Abolition of Slavery, published by Cambridge in 2010, which won no less than three book prizes. And finally, our fourth speaker will be Paul Hansen, professor of history at Butler University. Among many other publications he has done is, he is the author of The Jacobin Republic Under Fire, The Federalist Revolt and the French Revolution, published in 2003 by Penn State, and more recently in 2009, Contesting the French Revolution. Paul is a past president, of course, of this organization, the Western Society. So with that, I'm going to give the mic because we're being recorded uh, through H. France. I hope you all know that because you're going to be speaking and recorded too. So, so be sure to know that. And I'll give the mic to Lynn Hunt. Thanks, Gary. And thanks to uh, all the other people on the panel, my dear friends and colleagues. And also thanks to all of you. Um, I hope we don't go on too long so that we actually can have some discussion. Uh, so I will try to keep my remarks relatively brief. I wanted to start by raising a couple of general questions, I think, to keep in mind while we're talking. Uh, the first of those, most obviously, is that it seems to me there's some issue about what exactly is violence. How is it defined? And I think that's going to be one of the things that's going to come up in the conversation. Is it the numbers who die? Is it the way in which they die? Uh, is it the reasons that are adduced for killing people? Since I'm assuming for the most part we're talking about uh, people dying as, as a form of violence as, as opposed to the many, many other forms of violence that we could also be talking about. Uh, and that's related to a second general question, neither of which I'm going to actually talk about, which is, what is its role in revolutions? This has been one of the great classic questions of the French Revolution. I, I think it's important to keep in mind because it's been kind of effaced, especially in Anglophone historiography, less so amongst our Jacobin friends in France uh, who still are willing to embrace this question. I'm thinking of Sophie Vaniche, for example, uh, which is, is it necessary in revolution and is it justifiable? And to what s extent is it justifiable? This is something I think that Carla Hesse in Berkeley, for example, is uh, right now working on uh, as well. So general questions. The question that I want to raise that is interesting me currently is, it won't surprise you if you heard my talk yesterday, why violence now? Why is it coming to the forefront as an issue? And I, I think I maybe have a slightly different answer than other people would have. I've been very interested in the way in which, uh, it's not that violence is a new question, but perhaps that we can have new ways of framing the question. The study of collective violence, a la Charles Tilley, or George Roudet, Albert Soboul, even, I would say, Natalie Zeman Davis, Edward Thompson, was about explaining how crowd violence could be, in a sense, rational. Uh, retrieving it from right-wing crowd psychology, which said it was about people becoming irrational, hysterical, like women, like savages, uncivilized, uh, atavistic. And so there was a very long movement, I would argue, from the 50s, really, up to the present, uh, which was also very important for women's history, because women's role then was also explained in terms of why this made sense. So obviously, I was formed by this tradition, and it's not that I want to I criticize it. I think, however, it leaves room now for a return to especially under the influence of the new interest in emotions in history, in thinking about violence in slightly different terms, and I believe also thinking about women's history, therefore, in slightly different terms, and recognizing that violence has, for short, let us call it, an irrational or non-rational element as well, that has very much to do with bodily 
emotions. And also has very much to do with something that was true about crowd psychology, is that something happens when people are packed close <coughs> together in public spaces under certain kinds of circumstances of tension, especially political, social, and economic tension, that pe gets people to do things that actually they wouldn't normally do. So I'm interested in that as part of the sort of interest in emotions in history. You heard that I'm interested in neuroscience in history. I'm interested in this kind of somatic understanding of violence. Now, but here I am very different from William Reddy, who's talked about emotions in history in terms of sentimentalism as an emotive style of really the elites. I'm interested in a more sort of somatic form of emotions that has to do with ordinary people. So this has, so I'm not going to tell you about this. Uh, this is where I'm going to end. <laughs> this is where I'm going to end. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end by saying I think there's room now for rethinking this question in these terms. And I'm interested in studies of crowd behavior by social scientists and how we can use it to reevaluate certain key incidents in the revolution. Uh, many of them already talked about uh, in somewhat synthetic form by Jean Clément Martin in his book on violence in the French Revolution, which I think is an extremely important book. And I'm myself about to start working on the October days sort of from this kind of perspective and what it says about the role of women in mobilizing certain kinds of emotions and not just certain kinds of political outcomes. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is going to be a challenge to keep balance notes on the microphone, but I'll do my best. Um, so what I would like to talk about um, briefly is um, notions of violence that were formulated after Thermidor. Um, I think that when we talk about revolutionary violence, we talk overwhelmingly about the terror. So what I want to talk about is how our image of the violence of the terror was shaped by Thermidorian representations and how, those, how our consideration of that can reshape our notion of revolutionary violence and its relationship to republicanism, citizenship, um, and the, the whole issue of ending the French Revolution. Now, as I said, I think that our notion of the terror is still, historians are still wrestling with the notion of the terror that was bequeathed to us by the Thermidorians. Um, the, after Thermidor, polemicists reshaped what was a chaotic series of events created by food shortages and war and domestic violence, as well as power struggles and ideology. They reshaped this kind of chaotic series of events into a seemingly coherent moment for which they held Robespierre and the Jacobins possible. Now, they, after Thermidor, um, the polemicists, many of whom are the early polemicists were Republicans, um, and they used, they sort of used accusation to condemn the terror. Now, some of these Republicans were Jacobin turncoats who used accusation to um, deflect attention from their own malfeasance. Some were using accusation as um, a, a way of um, sort of engaging in a power struggle for control of the convention after Thermidor. Some were settling scores for their own suffering during the terror. But what these polemicists had in common was the use of a form of denunciation that the Jacobins themselves had honed during the terror. But they turned this denunciation back against the Jacobins and accused them of responsibility for the terror. What makes these denunciations uniquely post-Thermidorian is that they were adopted by um, Men, this is almost exclusively a male, um, a male set of rhetorics. Um, they were adopted by men on the right, conservative Republicans, monarchists, royalists. Um, so what you see after Thermidor in 1794, 1795, is for the first time since 1789, there's a rough agreement about who the nation's principal enemies are. They're Jacobins. And you also see a crystallization of the idea of an anarchic terror. Now, what interests me is that this anarchic terror served um, as a justification for conservative Republicans to reject democracy. And this becomes visible in the speech that Boissy d'Anglas gave to the um, National Convention in the winter, in the summer of 1795. 
Boisey had to explain why his committee, which had been appointed to um, ready to, to sort of activate the suspended democratic constitution of 1793, Boisey had to explain why his committee, rather than readying that constitution, scrapped it and produced a whole new constitution that was much more conservative, the constitution of 1795. And what Boisey told the convention is he said that their task was to save France from the chaos and license associated with, quote, the disastrous illusions of anarchy. He argued that the Constitution, the Democratic Constitution of 1793, was dangerous because on the one hand, it, because it impinged on property. It impinged on property, which he considered the foundation of all social order, by um, promising social welfare through guarantees of public assistance and the right to work, um, and also by establishing democracy. Because like many 18th century critics, Boissy believed that democracy empowered poor men to legislate in ways that were um, damaging to agriculture and industry and commerce because they either could not or would not appreciate the damage that they could do. Um, so Boissy continued that if the nation were to keep this democratic constitution, quote, it would return us to the violent convulsions from which we so recently emerged. So the directory, which comes into being in the fall of 1795, the directory was founded on an explicit repudiation of a violent anarchic terror. Now one of the most comprehensive contemporary critiques of this particular view of the terror was formulated by the radical Democrat, Gracchus Babeuf. What Babeuf argued, he praised the Constitution of 1793 for enfranchising all men and for defending social welfare with precisely the same kinds of guarantees that Boissy condemned. Um, the right, the guarantee of the right to work and the right to public assistance as well as the right to education. Babeuf argued that there could only be true liberty if all men shared in national decision making and that genuine civil equality required the greater social equality that was uh, guaranteed by sufficient food, lodging and work for all citizens. So he, he said that the Thermidorian Convention had betrayed its own work in the revolutionary promises of the Constitution of 1793 by um, repudiating social welfare when it abolished the maximum on prices and when it disenfranchised the masses by illegally adopting the Constitution of 1795. Um, and he went on and he said that the directory had enhanced its illegitimate foundation by repudiating civil liberties like free speech and free association. This, Babeuf argued, was true revolutionary violence. So Babeuf used words like despotism, oppression, and poverty. But I think we can also characterize him as elaborating categories of subjective and objective violence like those that the philosopher Zizek uses. Um, subjective violence is highly visible and readily condemned. So in our case, the violence of the terror seen as stretching from the massacres, the September massacres, um, popular violence around the September massacres to state-sponsored violence of, the, of guillotining. Objective violence, on the other hand, and this is Zizek's formulation, is the, quote, often catastrophic consequence of the smooth functioning of our economic and political systems. So it's the oppression and violence upon which a smoothly running society is founded. For Babeuf, the true violence that the nation suffered was popular starvation that followed the abolition of the maximum on prices. It was disenfranchisement of the masses and it was the persecution of old militants. This was the kind of violence that political elites deemed acceptable violence to stabilize the republic and which they justified with their partisan accounts of the violence of the terror. Now this is not to deny the violence of the terror, but it's to historicize an idea of the terror that lives on in popular imagination and continues to haunt historical scholarship. Um, when um, I would argue that when we talk about that we the sort of to account to speak of the violence of the terror, the accounts of the violence of the terror after Thermidor did not just reveal truths that we as historians have to explain. These were also ideological constructs that justified the restoration of another and more pervasive kind of violence against ordinary people. So in concluding, I will say there are two consequences of thinking about violence this way. In the first place, there is the ongoing project by historians <coughs> like Martin, like Carla Hess, like Sophie Vanish, um, and a few others I could mention to identify and explore limits 
restraints, and even success within the terror. The other is to look more critically at the period of the Directory, which is the object of a growing and largely celebratory scholarship. Now, on the one hand, the Directory witnessed a sustained effort to impose order, but that order came at the cost of inequality, oppression, and the loss of popular liberty. The Directory also saw projects to nourish republicanism and even democracy, but those remained elitist and exclusionary projects. So without, unless we are sort of have a historicized sense of revolutionary violence, um, it's that historicization reminds us that we have not only to weigh the costs of violence, the emergence of violence and the cost of violence in the early half of the revolution, but also to consider what replaced the violence of the terror and why those particular forms replaced it. <laughs>